Computer. Okay, well, good evening. Good to see all of you. So here we are on, here we are on week three, listening to the prophets, and to, today will be the second evening of Isaiah. Our first week was an introduction, introduction to prophecy in general, to the Bible in general, to prophecy and uh, explaining uh, different time periods and ages throughout biblical history. And last week was the first week really with Isaiah. And then tonight will be our second week with Isaiah. And then next week, get into Jeremiah. And again, whatever you do, do not miss next week. Jeremiah is an incredible book. You're going to love that. So going on. If it'll change. There we go. Listening to the prophets are a theme that I'm going to try and keep up for the whole session. Again, the prophets' words are as relevant as they were relevant today as they were uh, 2,600 years ago. So the Bible never gets old. It's updated. No matter what you're reading, it applies to today. And uh, the Lord, the second part, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And I don't want you ever to forget that. That is so important because I, I don't know. I think we all as Christians struggle with this from time to time, thinking that we've let God down, wondering if he's mad at us and whatever. No, he's not. He's compassionate and merciful. And then we get the second part, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. And again, you think, well, gee whiz, you know, is he angry with me? Are you slow to get anger? Or, you know, is it about at that edge? He's going to be, no. He, uh, when you read the Old Testament prophets, and, and not only the Old Testament prophets, but just Old Testament in general, God was very slow to get angry with those who were disbelieving in him. He let a lot of time go, like hundreds of years before he finally pronounced judgment on them. And so when it says slow to get angry, that's to the unbeliever. And again, the anger is at the sin that he's seeing in that person because they're refusing him over and over and over. So God is compassionate, merciful to all of us, but to the unbeliever, the sinner, he's very slow, you know, before judgment comes and he's going to do everything until he knows that person's heart is never going to turn. God knows that, you know, and so when that time happens, whether God allows that person to leave the earth, you know, to die or whatever, whatever it may be, God just knows this person is never going to open up their heart. And so judgment comes, but judgment not to the believer. Okay, so here we go kind of through chapters 40 to 66. And we're going to get into some amazing prophecies tonight. And we're going to, even though I know you probably looked at your lesson, thought, oh, one, two, three pages. Hey, that is so cool. We don't have a whole lot here. We'll be out of here real fast. Well, we've got a ton of scripture to go through. So, uh, so hey, hang on. Uh, we're, we're going to make it through to the end. But it's really neat scripture. And I hope by the end of today, tonight, uh, it's going to really start clicking on being able to open up almost anywhere in the Old Testament and begin reading passages and be thinking, okay, I'm understanding what this is talking about, what time period this is talking about. So I think tonight is going to be a real eye-opener and being able to see, we're going to look at various types of passages and be able to see, oh, is this uh, their time? Is this uh, time of the millennial time? Is this time about Jesus time? Uh, you know, uh, is this talking about captivity time? Wh whatever. And so I think you're going to be able to see that. So God's consolations and blessings. We talked last week about God's condemnations in the book of Isaiah. He condemned a lot of the surrounding nations for harassing Israel, but then also he condemned Israel itself because as we studied, they had turned so far away from God. And this is something that we really don't think about happening until you read scripture, how horribly they treated or the, uh, how horrible they were in honoring God. They forgot who God was. They were honoring foreign gods. They lost the law. They weren't even following the law of one uh, at a big part of their history. They were even sacrificing their sons in fire to foreign gods. They were basically a heathen nation. There's one part in scripture that says that they were actually in some ways more heathen than some of the surrounding nations. So it's hard to believe that God's chosen people went that far. Yes, 
but showing God's mercy, he kept giving prophet after prophet after prophet, telling them to come back. And then they would for a while. They think, ah, oh, yes, they've got it. And then by the next king, slid right back down and sometimes even worse. And so you think, well, why? What was up with that? Well, as I mentioned last week, I think a lot of it was because they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in them. And this is what happens to a person who has never given their heart to the Lord, who does not have the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. They try to be good, but it just never works. Without the help of God's Holy Spirit in us, we just can't keep it up, it seems like. But even if we do have God's spirit in us, we're still going to goof up. We're still going to make mistakes. But the blessing of that is we're forgiven. Now, Isaiah 40, 35 explained God's provisions for Israel as they prepared to return from captivity. Now, remember here, and let me get my pen working. We'll do red. Um, Israel was right in here. And they were going to be taken by the Babylonian kingdom under King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar came uh, across up here, really the Fertile Crescent, came down, captured Jerusalem in three different waves of time, finally ending in 586 BC when it was completely destroyed. So Isaiah in uh, 40 verses 3 through 5 is talking about future because he died before the Babylonian captivity. Now he saw the northern kingdom become captured under the Assyrian Empire. But by the time of uh, 605 BC, Babylon had conquered the Assyrian Empire. Isaiah was already dead. And this is where we now next week we'll get to Jeremiah. Daniel and Ezekiel. So there, those three are going to live through the Babylonian captivity, but Isaiah did not, but he knows it's going to happen. So he says, the voice of one calling out, this might kind of ring a bell for New Testament about John the Baptist, it says the voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the uneven ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, this is kind of, again, one of those, I feel, those skipping stone uh, prophecies, whereby it's prophesying for something immediate, but also means something farther down, and then something even beyond that. So uh, Isaiah is prophesying that there's going to be a time that after they're captured in Babylon, that God is going to prepare a way for their return, okay, that they are going to return, and Jeremiah is going to prophesy that it'll be 70 years. But then also, as we remember reading John the Baptist, it tells of him that he prepared the way of the Lord. In fact, uh, on John 1, 23, say this reference, parallel, this reference parallels a reference to John the Baptist who prepared the way for Christ in John chapter 1, verse 23, because we hear the same thing. He said, I am the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord straight, as Isaiah the prophet said. So here John, here we read in John 1, 23, quoting Isaiah the prophet we just read about. So not only was Isaiah telling the people after 70 years in captivity, God's going to prepare a way for you, but 600 years later, John the Baptist is going to make uh, prepare a way for the Lord. So we're going to see a number of instances where the, Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament. Now, Isaiah 40, 29-31 is also a well-known passage and gives promise for those who wait on the Lord. Now, there were righteous people in uh, Israel at this time, even though Israel was so corrupt, there were righteous people. Remember, Elijah thought he was the only one righteous, and yet, no, God had prepared a myriad, a number of righteous people throughout the land of Israel. He was not alone. So a lot of you might recognize this verse. He gives strength to the weary. Now, Isaiah is not only encouraging those 
who are righteous in the land of Israel. And when I'm saying Israel, I'm technically meaning Judah because technically Israel had been taken captive. So sometimes I, I'll use it synonymously, but Judah would be the correct uh, usage here. He's get, telling the people to not be wary, to be strong. Okay, God's going to take care of you. But when they get into captivity, finally over in Babylon, they're going to read Isaiah's words and it's going to be read over to them. And he's going to be encouraging them and saying, don't be weary, stay where you are and prosper. Okay. In fact, this is something Jeremiah is going to be telling them. He's going to say, don't fight the king of Babylon. Go with the king. Don't fight it. Go with them. God will be with you in that foreign land and he'll, he'll help you prosper. Now, in some ways, God, I think, was being very merciful in punishing Israel because for some reason, Israel could not really survive as their own nation. They were constantly, well, they had split into two nations for one. They were constantly warring with each other. They, it seems as though they were not able to survive on their own. So not only was Babylon a punishment, I think it was a blessing to get them under some form of government whereby they could get reorganized and get their heads on straight. And so it really was, a, I think, a blessing that they were captured. And sometimes I think in our life, what we think has become just something really terrible that's come our way, I think sometimes it's a blessing. We just don't see it. We need to be where we are. And so try and remember this. If you feel weary, God will give you strength. And to the one who lacks might, he's going to increase power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength, okay? And so whatever it is you're going through, I just have to say, I know sometimes it's so hard to wait for the Lord and to just trust in what he's doing. Yeah, but it hurts. You know, I don't like it. I, I'm uncomfortable. I, whatever it is, the Lord is saying, I'll give you strength. I'll give you strength. We were talking about this just before the lesson. We don't know sometimes why we have to go through things, but God does give us strength as we go through it. And I think there's a lot of people in this room that can attest to that. Uh, yeah, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. Now, uh, again, this little chart here, let me just go over it real briefly because I'm going to be talking about it. And it's kind of our chart on what's going to happen at end times. Okay. And so, so when I mentioned tribulation, millennium, and church age, and rapture, and things like this, it kind of hopefully is starting to formulate a little bit. But here again for a timeline, uh, here's the cross, uh, Jesus died. Now, up to this time, the Jews were in charge of spreading the gospel. Well, they didn't. They were supposed to, and we'll get to a verse a little bit later, they were to usher in the Messiah. It was the Jews' responsibility to usher him in. Well, they didn't. They killed him, which was part of God's plan. Because if think about it. Had they never killed Christ, then he would never have died for our sins would have been under condemnation. So even that was part of God's plan for him to die. So because they didn't uh, accept him, then uh, the dead Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given, and we call this, you can call it the church age or, or the formation of the church age that we're in now. And church meaning all believers in Christ. We're all one body in Christ. Now, at any point of time, whatever, and I gave some scripture the first week, and that might not be a bad idea to kind of look, take your books and go over week one again, where we go over some of this, but Christ is going to come, blink of an eye, we're going to hear him, he's going to not come on the earth, okay, he's going to come in the clouds, and we're going to see him and the clouds, and we're going to uh, rise up with them, and we're going to be with them in heaven for seven years, okay? During that time, the church is not going to be 
on earth. Now, what's kind of strange about this, there's going to be a moment in time when there will not be one righteous person standing on the earth. Can you imagine what that is? Because they're gone. They're raptured. Everyone who is there are unbelievers. But very, very quickly, God is going to raise up 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the uh, 12 tribes to evangelize the world. And but during that time, and chances chances are, except for the 144,000, those who come to know the Lord will probably die as a martyr. Okay, and that's what the book of Revelation is going to be. Uh, most of the book of Revelation is going to be talking about is what's going to happen during that time period. Don't let us scare you. We won't be there. Okay, but it's a time where Satan is basically lit loose. After seven years, Christ is going to come. We call it his second, second advent or his second coming. Okay, when you hear his second coming, that's not the rapture. It's he's going to, this black line should be actually a little farther. He's going to come on the earth and we will come with him. See the red arrow? We go up, go over, and we come down. We're going to come down and we'll reign with him for 1,000 years. Now, at the very end uh, of this, right before he comes, is going to be a battle called Armageddon. Okay, and we'll talk about that as time goes on the next few weeks or so. And we'll usher in a 1,000-year millennial reign. This is where Jesus will be King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and he'll rule from Jerusalem. And the earth will be just uh, have a tremendous prosperity. I, 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 it's my belief that the earth is going to have an enormous transformation. I think things are going to start growing green. I, I believe when Adam and Eve sinned, we had a, 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 almost an instant transformation around the world. Plants, animals, human beings changed. Uh, and, but I believe during the millennial, we're going to start seeing a very quick restoration of the earth, uh, Satan will be bound for a thousand years, but demonic activity will still be there. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released from his thousand year imprisonment. And uh, those who reject Jesus during the thousand years, because earth will be populated by those who did not die in the tribulation, they'll repopulate. There'll be people believing, there'll be unbelievers. They're going to try one last attack on Jesus right at the end of the thousand years, but it won't even get off the ground and it's over with. And that's where we have the great white throne judgment, which I'll talk about at the end of the lesson. So that's kind of an overview of it. So when you hear me talk about millennium, it's a thousand years, tribulations is seven years, the second coming. Now see, see, this is the thing with the Jews. Uh, it was hidden from them. They did not know a church age was going to even be formed. So let's see if I can clean some of this up here. <laughs> Um, there we go. They, they didn't know this was going to exist. Uh, this is why Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Because a mystery was something that was not revealed to Old Testament believers. Why wasn't it revealed to Old Testament believers? Well, because God was not foretelling him that they were going to mess up. Okay, God was telling him, bring in the Messiah, bring in the Messiah. He was not going to tell them uh, of uh, supposed to even be a church age because that would be telling them their failure right from the get-go. So it was hidden from their eyes, even though, as we'll see tonight, there's references for the Gentiles coming into the fold, but they didn't understand that. All they knew that the Messiah, and to see, they didn't even know the Messiah was going to die, which... As uh, tonight, we're going to understand why did you not know that? It, it was very clear that the Messiah was going to die. But see, they didn't know it. They didn't know the church age. They just thought they were going to come and come and come and live and live until finally the Messiah would come His uh, for the first time in their life. They thought they didn't know, know of his second coming. They thought he was going to just come and set up his rule. That's what the disciples thought when Jesus came. They didn't understand, even they, that he was going to die. They asked, is this a time now that you're going to set up your kingdom? So the, so they, the Jews did not understand, you know, all that this that was happening here. Now, Isaiah 42, uh, these uh, verses here, explain that the Messiah will fill the old covenant and install a new one. Okay, so... And then we'll also see Matthew 5. So Isaiah says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, 
my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Okay, there, he's talking here about uh, the Messiah. Okay, he will not cry out. Remember Jesus before Pilate didn't say anything. He kept quiet, nor raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. I am the Lord. Okay, I have called you in righteousness. Now you could say there could be almost a parallel thing going, talking about the Messiah and also talking about Israel itself. Okay, I have called you because Israel was to be called in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. Okay. And I will point you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. So Israel was also to be a light to the, all, all the nations. Then the Messiah, now what was the Messiah's role in this? To open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. That's what Jesus did. He opened the eyes. He cast out demons. And those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Behold, the former things have come to pass now I declare new things. So what he's doing, he's prophesying that the Messiah is going to do something new. And what was that new thing that's going to get rid of the law? Okay, and this again is not totally what they were understanding. I'm going to do something new. Before they sprout, I proclaim them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. He's prophesying that the Messiah is going to do something brand new and end sacrifices, end the Mosaic law. Okay, He's going to be the perfect sacrifice. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it. You islands and those who live uh, uh, on them, they're in them. Do not, and then Matthew 5, 17, Jesus parallels Isaiah by saying, do not pursue that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So he's to saying to Isaiah, what Isaiah is saying, I'm come to do something new. But they didn't understand that. They thought that uh, he was going to come and abolish the Roman Empire. And that was pro probably the new thing. No, he was bringing a new salvation to the people. He wasn't abolishing it. He was the end result of it. But there again, they, they weren't getting it. Now, what's interesting, we get to Isaiah 44, and he makes this incredible, amazing prophecy about Cyrus. Now, what's going to happen is when they're in Babylon for their 70 years, the Medo-Persian Empire, which is east of Babylon, see here, we've got a cool map, um, the Babylonian Empire, okay, uh, right, right around in, in here, uh, is, was almost this green area, really. But then the Persian Empire was now building and building and building. So it overtakes the Babylonian Empire while they are in their 70 years in captivity. So they get the capital actually moves. And uh, so it moves for, uh, from Babylon, okay, and has a brand new capital. The uh, Persians are now in charge. The Babylonians have been defeated, and Cyrus is the new Persian king. So what does Isaiah say in the chapter 44 and 45? He gave an incredible prophecy specifically naming the man Cyrus as the future king of Persia. Now, Cyrus would eventually authorize the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. Now, Cyrus is going to play a very important part because at the end of the 70-year captivity, Cyrus is going to be the Medo-Persian king that is going to allow the Jews to come back to their homeland and uh, begin rebuilding the temple and the walls. And we'll get into this when we get into Daniel, the book of Daniel more. The fulfillment of this prophecy took place approximately 150 years after Isaiah's prophecy and 70 years after their captivity. So at the end of the 70 years, this man Cyrus is going to release them and let them come back. So let's see what Isaiah 44 says. It says, now this is 150 years before this happens. Isaiah did not live to see Cyrus. 
No, so it says, and it, it is I who says of Cyrus, he names him by name, he is my shepherd, and he will carry out all my desires. And he says of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Now, Isaiah 45 goes on, and he names him again. He says, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to undo the weapons built on the waste of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. So he's prophesying that there's a man going to be called Cyrus who's going to allow the Jews to come back after their 70 years. Now, uh, someone might say, let me go to the next one here. And I'll say, Isaiah's prophecy occurred approximately 150 years before Cyrus made his decree. Now, someone could easily say, well, someone wrote that in, in the, the Bible, you know, and uh, Isaiah after it happened. No, no, you've got to understand Jewish history and script. You didn't just put things in to the, uh, the, the Jewish writings. It didn't happen. Uh, scribes were very, very meticulous. There was would, would be no way, and the people had memorized these books. There were people who had memorized the actual entire Old Testament by memory. They had done this. So no one was going to suddenly come in and, oh, I'm going to write something new here. It didn't happen. Okay, they were that that clear on their writings. They were that detailed. Uh, they did not, would not make mistakes. They edited it, edited it. And so you got to just understand Jewish fact and history to understand that. No, someone didn't just throw this in after the fact. The same thing when we get to Daniel. His prophecies are so amazing that a lot of people have criticized and said there's no way he wrote it when he did. How did he understand that uh, Babylon was going to fall? How did he understand Medo-Persia was going to fall? How do you know that Greece was going to be the next one? And then Rome comes after that. There's no way he could have known that. Well, he did. And no one could have suddenly just written it in there and made it stick without people saying, hey, you know, that's a forgery. Now, compare this with Exodus 1. Now, when we get to the point when Cyrus allows the people to come back, look what he says to his own people, the Medo-Persians. He says, now the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, this is 150 years after the prophecy, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah is the one that gives the number. It's going to be 70 years. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. Is this me? Okay, says. I think I'm getting a feedback here. The, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has appointed me to rebuild for him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Okay, now let's see. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Now, Cyrus is saying this. And to every survivor at whatever place he may live, the people of Persia, of that place, are to support these Jews with silver and gold, with equipment and cattle, together with a voluntary offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So he was commanding his own people to give up gold and silver to the Jews so they can make their way back and uh, uh, rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, look at the very similar thing that happened, remember, in Exodus, when Moses told Pharaoh to let my people go, and uh, the night that they were going to go, it says, now the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And that was the Passover when the oldest child of each house died who did not have the mark uh, of the blood mark on their doorpost. 
When he lets you go, he will assuredly drive you out from here completely. Speak now so that the people hear, that each man is to ask of his neighbor and each woman of her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. So same thing happened. When God's people left, he provided for them. And the Lord gave the people favor. I love this phrase. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. You know, sometimes if you're in a really bad situation, it's something I've done before. You're working with somebody or you need something. God, just give me favor. Give me favor in their eyes, you know, so I can just, you know, be a witness for you, but uh, but so my well-being, just give me favor. I think God pleases God's heart to give us favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. See, remember Isaiah was telling them to, to remain faithful, not to be discouraged, hang in there, it's going to be okay. And now they're going to come back and they're going to be provided for. God is going to provide for them and make sure that they're going to have what they need. Now, even though God used Cyrus, a very interesting passage. Did Cyrus know God? Did he have a heart change toward God? Well, are we going to see Cyrus in heaven? Unfortunately, I don't think we are because look what happens. It says Isaiah 45, 5 seems to indicate he did not know him personally, because we read in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Well, we'll do the Isaiah 45 first. I am the Lord, and Isaiah is saying this now about Cyrus. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. There is no God except me. I will arm you, though you have not known me. Now, how can that be? How you not doesn't know him. Well, let's look at New Testament Philippians. How can someone honor God, but really not have a heart transformation? Well, Philippians says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and have given Jesus a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, there's going to come a time every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus comes for a second time, it's going to, his second coming, it is going to be so severe. It's going to be so miraculous. It's going to be so mighty that people are going to worship him and honor him, but not give their lives to him. Okay, so it's possible to recognize God's power without giving your life to him. So I think this is what was with Cyrus. He, uh, he understood the power of God, which a lot of non-Christians do have a, an awareness. Well, all people have an awareness of God. Romans 1 tells us that. And they have an awareness, but they refuse to give themselves up to God. Okay. And so this is, I think, what it was. Now, Isaiah 48, as we go on, I'm just kind of doing chapter skipping as we're going farther along in the 40s. We're 48 now. Isaiah 48, 12 explains Christ was not created, but he always existed. So it says, listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I called. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. So Alpha Omega. First meaning I was before anything and I am after everything. I was never created. I will never cease. Revelation 17 or 117 says, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he, uh, the angel, it is, placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. Uh, and he was looking at Christ. I am the first and the last. Okay, he saw this. Actually, it was Christ. And Christ says, again, is Alpha Omega. Revelation 22 he says again, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So Isaiah is very quick to reference that God, Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end, that he's the God of all gods. Because see, Israel was going into paganism. They were doing these false teachings and false doctrines, and they were worshiping idols. And Isaiah is saying, no, the God Jehovah is above all of these. He was not made with hands. It's Christ's role on earth. 
Now, it's also interesting how uh, Isaiah 48 references the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is, uh, as we see up here, Trinity meaning three. We believe that God is, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're three entities, but they're one. You ask, well, how can that be? Well, we'll find out when we get to heaven. But I, Isaiah 46 uh, references that, and so does Deuteronomy 6. So let's look at it. Isaiah 48 says, come near to me, listen to this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. In other words, from the beginning of time, God has always made his glory known. From the time it took place, I was there. Uh, so technically here, Christ is actually speaking here because it says, and now the Lord God has sent me, Jesus, and his spirit. So Isaiah is prophesying Jesus is the one doing the speaking here through Isaiah. And we see the references of God, Jesus, the spirit. So what's it saying about Jesus? He was always, he was never created. It says here, from the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. So, so if Jesus was never created, God was never created, the spirit was never created, the three are one. Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord. Now, this is a real interesting one. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, uh, uh, the word God, I put Lord twice up there for some reason, but God is Elohim. Elohim is a plural noun. So this would technically say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our gods is one Lord. So there again, we understand we're getting references that God is a three-part um, trinity. <laughs> He's a three-part three entity, a three-part being, you might say. And so we're already getting that clear back in uh, Deuteronomy. Now, Isaiah 49, this is commissioning Israel to bring God's message of salvation to a Gentile world. Again, this is, they, they were not understanding, I mean, uh, gen, the gospel is to go to Gentiles? Yes. Okay. In fact, we know Gentiles could become proselytes, meaning they could at that time come into the fold of Israel and not be, and become a Jew, not by birth, okay, but by practice, okay, but it was going to eventually the gospel spread out from Israel to the whole world. It says, announces the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God is my strength. Okay, so uh, the Lord, see, uh, he, we're kind of got two things going here, Jesus Okay, and Israel the same. The Lord formed Jesus, the, form, the Lord formed Israel to be, Jesus is the servant, even though he is God himself, Israel is to be the servant too. Okay, and so Israel was to be gathered back to God, to honor God, and verse six, he says, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up tribes of Jacob and to restore the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you Christ and Israel. See, Israel, I will make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So right away, uh, God is telling the Jews, you are to be the light of the world. Christ was also the light of the world. It's kind of a, a two-in-one thing going on here right now. Uh, so uh, Christ is the light of the world, but he was to do it through Israel. Israel didn't understand this. They thought the Jews were uh, to be kept away from, you know, to that they would... The Jews thought the Gentiles that was, would defile them. They were to stay away from them. Uh, says to the despised one, Jesus was despised, Israel was despised, to the one abhorred by the nations. Now, we're going to focus on the Jesus part here. 
This is what the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One says to the despised one. Okay, the Lord meaning God. We're going to talk about Jesus. This is what God is going to say to Jesus. Okay, this is what God is also going to say to the nation of Israel. To the one abhorred by the nation. Okay, now I'm going to stop here. I've got an A and a B. You'll see why. It says, traditions, um, well, let me go on a second here. Let's see where I have that. Okay. Okay, let me do this. Tradition states, and I just put a little, I added this. You don't have this in your book, but I thought, well, this is a good place to put this, uh, about Isaiah. Uh, tradition states that Isaiah was killed by being sawed in two, perhaps from within a log. Uh, it's not in the Bible. It's tradition that says that. Like some, some people say that he was actually stuffed into a log, and they sawed it in half. Some people say he ran from high, apparently was being chased and ran up into a tree. They saw that in half. Uh, and But we do know in Hebrews 1137, this is the great uh, chapter of the faith, those who, who were giants of the faith. Now, faith is the certainty of things hoped for, proof of things not seen. For by it, the people of old gained approval. Then you read verses 3, 4, 5, 6, all 3 to 12, and they talk about great men of the Bible. Then we get to 13. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. In other words, these men of faith knew that the Messiah was coming but they knew they wouldn't see it, but they remained faithful. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. And this is what they, the tradition says what happened to Isaiah, that he was sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, people of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts on mountains and sheltering in caves and holes in the ground. You know, I think, I think God is calling us right now, Christians, to be, to be his army. I think he's calling Christians around the world today to stand up and become the, his army, to ask for strength, to ask God to, for his protection, but to be willing to do this. He's looking for a people who's willing to stand up for him, who's willing to give everything they have to him. And I think he's waiting for that to happen. And I think we're on the verge of this beginning to happen. God's reaching hearts and touching. He's calling an army. No longer can we sit on the fence and be wishy-washy being a Sunday Christian. Okay, I think I'll believe, but I won't say much about it. There's going to be a time coming in time where we're either going to stand out or we don't, you know. And I think God is calling forth an army like this. Are we to be afraid? No. When God gives you that courage, you've got courage. Fear goes. But I think he's, he's calling us to something that uh, we don't know what it is. But I think we need to really pray for God's strength, his anointing, because I think he's about to do something quite incredible with the Christian community. And we got to have our armor and we've got to be uh, ready to go and put the world and its pleasures aside. Not that we should sell everything. I'm not meaning that, but not to make that our focus. I think he's looking for a church that's willing to get into his word, to begin studying it, begin listening to what he has to say, to begin saying, God, use me, you know, use me. The scripture says, you know, behold, whom shall I send? It says Isaiah says, send me, send me. You know, are we the ones willing to, to be sent? for him. And this is what he's looking for, his army. Unfortunately, Israel rejected Christ during his first coming. Now, this is where we get uh, back into 7a. I put uh, an A and a B here. So I will make you light of the nations. That didn't happen. Jesus was the one who was despised, one abhorred by the nation of Israel. Okay, then we get into part B. Now, this is where you start being able to understand the Old Testament, what he's talking about. Okay. Whenever you start seeing part B arising, to the servant of rulers, kings will arise 
Princes also will bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. He's talking about the millennial reign now. Whenever you start staying in the Bible where God, that Israel is going to rejoice again, Israel is going to be prosperous again. You'll read places where all of Israel is going to come to know God. And that will come a time right at the end. Uh, of the uh, uh, tribulation period, the battle of Armageddon. There's going to be a massive battle in Israel. Uh, a great portion of non-believing Jews are going to be raced out of Jerusalem, but there's going to be a remnant, and we'll get into these, okay? There's going to be a remnant that is going to remain in Jerusalem, and that is going to be considered his Israel. And when he comes, that remnant who's going to stay in Jerusalem, they're all going to come to know him. They're all going to be his. So when you start reading scriptures, when uh, so that you will all know me, you will all be blessed. Uh, kings will bow, bow down. Princes will bow, uh, bow down. This is the millennial time. And the thing about prophets that makes it hard is he goes from instantly one, it says, to one who is despised. And now we're talking about kings and princes will bow down to them. Well, the prophets do this. They'll suddenly be talking about uh, present time, but then the next sentence or within the same sentence, jump over to a huge quantum leap to the millennial reign or to Jesus first coming as the Messiah. So we start to starting to now to understand how to pick apart a lot of these Old Testament uh, scriptures. Now, Israel will receive Christ as king during his second coming. And that's what, again, part, uh, part B was all about. Let's, let's see. Okay. I just, I just lost my notes. So let me come back up here. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Um, you can tell, you know, I'm not that perfect polished speaker that just always has, you think, how do they do that? You know, I'm just, hey, if it messes up, it messes up. We go on, okay. Traditions, again, uh, so here we go. And so, uh, so we're beginning to see here, you know, what, uh, how to start interpreting a lot of this. I, this is one reason why a lot of people don't like to read the Old Testament, because they think, gee whiz, the thing just doesn't make sense. Okay, Isaiah, again, foretold the piercing of Christ's hands at the crucifixion. Now, I'm going to change this in our notes. Uh, I said, uh, Isaiah 49 foretold the piercing of Christ's hands at his cru crucifixion. Uh, I'm really going to change that because... Um, I don't think that's what it's really saying. <laughs> so let, let me read this. But Zion said, the Lord has abandoned me. Okay, Zion is another name for Israel. Okay, the Lord has abandoned me, or Jerusalem. It's actually another name for Jerusalem. But Zion said, the Lord has abandoned me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Okay. Can a woman forget her nursing child when, when Israel is, or Judah, Jerusalem is going to be taken away? People are going to think, uh, God's forgotten me. And Isaiah is going to say, when this happens, no, God has not abandoned you. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. And then it says, behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. And I put in my notes a foretelling of Christ's piercing. No, I don't think it is. I kind of messed up there. We'll read that later. What, what this is really meaning is Jesus is telling the, the Israelites, I have inscribed you on my hands. It's not talking about the piercing of, of the cross. Your walls are continually before me. So he's trying to, Isaiah's telling them, look, when the time comes and you're taken away to Babylon, don't think I have forgotten you. I haven't. This is why when you get in the book of Daniel, you read these incredible things of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, the, the fiery furnace, and uh, these different stories. God was letting them know, I have inscribed you on my hands. You're in the palm. I have not given you up because they would have definitely felt God had given them up. 
because their homeland was gone, their sacrifices was gone, the altar was gone. It is the Holy of Holies, the temple, their sacrifices is how they communicated with God, God and was gone now. And so God is saying, no, 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 I, I'm still with you. So those times in your life when you think God has left you, he's got you right in the palm of his hands. He, he, you're right, right there. Isaiah 50 discloses Christ as the obedient servant. Now, th this is, I just love the song we sang tonight because uh, it's all about Jesus. This whole, all these sections, we were talking about the Messiah, he's coming, he's coming. Yeah, so we see him now as a suffering servant. And this is why it's so hard to understand why the Jews didn't get it. But see, their hearts were hardened. The, the, the Jewish leaders, I think th they were power hungry. In fact, this is kind of a Mervinism. That's just my own thinking here. You're not going to read it probably anywhere. But uh, I personally think the, a lot of the Jewish leaders knew exactly who Jesus was. I think they, a lot of them knew he was the Messiah. They, they, they knew that. But you realize what would happen if they turned as the Messiah? They would no longer be top dog in the streets. No one would anymore follow them. They would follow Jesus. They would have to bow down to Jesus other than people bowing down to them. You see what pride does? I think they knew. I wouldn't be surprised. This is my feeling. How could they not know on some of these prophecies? Uh, and so, uh, it's, so it says in Isaiah 50, I gave my back to those who strike me. Now try and picture Jesus being whipped before his crucifixion. Isaiah is saying what the Messiah would be like. They should have made that connection. And I can't help but feel some of those um, Jewish leaders who were watching him being whipped was suddenly thinking of Isaiah 50. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I do not hide my face from insults and spitting. Remember, they spat on him. They, they pulled out his beard. How, how many of those high priests who knew scripture say, man, this is what's happening right now. For the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have made my face like flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. So Christ was able to go through this. So as they were seeing this happening, they had to have been seeing those uh, verse seven take place. How can a, a man withstand something like this? How can he withstand it, not speak out of the judgments that's going on? See, it was clearly there. This is why I say, you know, there's no such thing as an atheist. God makes himself clear to everybody. Whether it's through the stars in the skies, the mountains, the oceans, the valleys, the beauty, whatever, uh, he's there. He's proving himself. And Jesus was proving himself right there in front of those who are going to crucify him. And uh, exactly what Isaiah was prophesying. And I have to believe that they were thinking of Isaiah 50. Isaiah uh, 52 demonstrates the joys of the millennial period. Now, here again, as we'll see in Romans 10, so now suddenly he jumps to the millennial period. So let's read it, see if we can figure this out. Therefore, my people shall know my name. So when you read this, you think, well, what time period was this? I, I thought the people in 605, 587, 597, 586, I thought that's why they went and the Babylon, because they didn't know him, but it's saying my people shall know my name. Well, uh, where is that? Obviously, we're talking now the millennial period. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, on that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. How delightful on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news. When Jesus comes, you know, there's going to be probably a tremendous spreading uh, all around, you know, of the good news. It says every eye will see him. Okay, but this is again one of those skipping stones. How delightful on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news. Well, who's bringing good news on that day? Uh, uh, Isaiah was, Jeremiah was, Ezekiel was, Daniel was. Okay, they, they were the ones. Those Jews who had faith were the ones. Jesus was also the one uh, bringing the good news. 
And then in Matthew 28, he commissions us, the church, how delightful it is on the mountains of the feet who bring good news. So it kind of represents a whole wide group who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, this is Isaiah 52. I underline how delightful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Romans 10, 15, but, uh, Paul says, but how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written. Well, where was it written? Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. So you can see how the New Testament writers knew their scripture. They're quoting Isaiah. Isaiah is the, telling the future, and the, then the future is now referencing the past. And so we kind of have this mixture going like this. Let's see. Christ's birth and second coming. Now, Isaiah 9, now this is one, uh, I was uh, working along and all of a sudden I thought, my goodness, of all the Isaiah scriptures I haven't put in here, I haven't put in Isaiah 9. Okay, so I, I should have put this in last week, but I didn't. How many of you have uh, listened to Handel's Messiah? Well, this is where he gets it from, Isaiah 9. For unto us, and I had to do the King James Version because that's what Handel wrote it in. For unto us a child is born. You see where he's talking about Jesus here. Isaiah is talking about the Messiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Hmm. When is that going to happen? Millennium. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, he certainly wasn't called that when he was on earth, was he? We're talking millennial reign when he suddenly rules as king of king and lord of lords of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David. See, he's going to march into Jerusalem and he's going to rule rule from Jerusalem. He was from the lineage of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So in Handel's Messiah, he's talking about Christ during the millennial reign. Isaiah 52 tells of Christ's suffering in his death. Look at this. Who has believed a report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we would look at him, nor an appearance that we would take pleasure in him. He was despised and abandoned by men. So you've got to understand the, the Jewish rabbis and priests had to be looking at this and thinking, who are they talking about? Well, it's the Messiah. See, they, they, didn't, they, they were missing the point that the Messiah was going to suffer, that we should look at him, nor an appearance that would take pleasure in him. When Jesus was beaten in that and finally hung on the cross, he probably didn't even look like human. It was so beat up. He was despised and abandoned by men, a man of great pain and familiar with sickness. And like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we had no regard for him. See, he's prophesying what the Messiah was going to look like. However, it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God, and humiliated. See, the people there were probably possibly saying, oh, God is punishing him for blasphemy. No, he wasn't. He was taking our sins. Let's look and see what else Isaiah has to say about his death. But he was pierced for our offenses. See, that is the, the nailing of the hands. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him. Can you imagine what the uh, rabbis and the scribes and priests and high elders must have thought when suddenly the sky went black for hours when he was on the cross? He says the punishment of our well-being was laid upon him, and it goes dark. They had to have been thinking this, and by his wounds, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on 
him. So it's a, an incredible verse of what Jesus was like. Then it goes on. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like he did before Pilate. He didn't say anything. Like a lamb, he's led to slaughter. Like a sheep that is silent before his shares. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living for the wrongdoing of my people to whom the blow was due. And his grave was assigned with wicked men. He hung he had wicked people on either side. Yet, come on his grave, okay? Wicked men assigned him to a grave. Yet, he was with a rich man in his death. He was put in Lazarus' tomb. Lazarus was a, obviously a very wealthy man. He had made a tomb that had never been used before. And you had to be pretty wealthy to have your own carved out tomb. So here it's saying even where he was going to die, he was going to die in a rich man's tomb because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. If he renders himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offering, he'll prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Uh, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant will justify many. By Christ's death, many are going to be declared justified. We, when we ask Christ in our heart, it's as though we... Uh, I have never sinned, just as if, justify, just as if we had never sinned, for he will bear their wrongdoings. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, okay, because he poured out his life into, to death and was counted with wrongdoers, yet he himself bore the sin of, sin of many and interceded for the wrongdoers. So this is describing what, have, what happened to the Messiah, and they missed it, or did they? Hmm. Isaiah 55 relates how all can receive salvation, okay? You there, everyone who thirsts, okay, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. So notice it says everyone who thirsts. Now, he's going to be talking also about Gentiles. But see, the Jews, when Jesus came, they had nothing to do with the Gentile. Nothing at all. No, they can't come into our fold. But yet God is saying, no, everyone. Isaiah states how Gentiles could receive salvation. Behold, you will call a nation, okay, who you do not know. So wait a minute. I mean, other nations are going to be called. And a nation which does not know you will run to you, meaning well, it's going to come to God. There are going to be people outside of Israel, nations, that's going to be running to God because the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he's glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Okay, this is the thing. People can say, no, I don't want you, God. I don't want you, Jesus. I don't want anything to do with you. No, 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 no. Until finally their heart becomes so hard. They just don't hear the prompting anymore. Let the wicked abandon his way and the righteous person his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and the Lord will have compassion. Remember, that's our thing. Okay, compassion and mercy for he'll abundantly pardon. He'll forgive. See, see this is why he says his, he, he's slow to get angry. Even after all of this that Israel is doing, he's saying, come to me, come to me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, a well-quoted verse. Nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Amazing how many times we've heard Isaiah quoted and don't really always realize, oh, this is Isaiah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The passage also indicates why today is important in receiving Jesus as your Savior. We're never guaranteed a tomorrow. And so this is, again, this chart, you know, that one day Christ is coming. We're going to meet him. Now, um, Isaiah 53 gives a great promise to Gentiles. I'm going to talk about this little chart, those of you that 
uh, follow uh, Kent Tucker's how, how to believe uh, have seen this here. Um, Isaiah 56, let not the foreigner who has joined him tell himself to the Lord say. Now, he's talking to Gentiles here. Through Isaiah, he says, don't let the foreigner who's joined himself to the Lord, who's at this time become part of Israel today, who's accepted Christ. The Lord will certainly separate me from his people. Don't say that. Don't let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. By th then uh, a eunuch would be separated from Israel. Interesting. Who did Philip go to right after, you know, the uh, Pentecost and shortly thereafter? The eunuch coming from Ethiopia saying, everyone, uh, salvation is for everyone. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs, the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and to choose what pleases me, hold firmly to my covenant. And what is the Sabbath today? It's not Saturday. It's not Sunday. It's Jesus. Okay. It's Jesus. So those who have Jesus will uh, choose, will please him. Okay. Will be one of his fold. To them, I'll give, uh, to them, I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial. Anyone who comes to me will now be in my walls. I'll give them a name better than that of sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name which will not be eliminated. See, these are for Gentile people, he's saying. Also, the foreigners, see, who join themselves to the Lord, to attend his service and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath, back then it was for Gentiles who would join Judaism. Today, it's the Sabbath is no longer a day. Today, the Sabbath is Jesus. Hebrews says that quite well. And holds firmly to my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. Well, what are our burnt offerings and sacrifices today? That's our soul. We give it to Jesus. What else can we sacrifice greater than ourself? Okay. For my house will be called a house of prayer. Jesus quotes this, doesn't he? For all the peoples. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, I will yet gather others to them, to those already gathered. In other words, others, Gentiles, Jews, alike, uh, are going to be one. Okay, but, but they didn't get that. They weren't understanding it. Isaiah states how sin separates us from God. See, this is the greatest little thing here, because th this is kind of shows everything here. There's a great chasm between us and God. Now, even, it kind of looks like you could jump across. You can't. Let's say it's a mile across or a uh, quarter mile. Okay. And so, uh, so the wages of sin is death. Here we are. So we were trying to jump across this quarter mile chasm. We can't. Okay. So we do good works. It falls down. We give money falls down. You know, we give of ourselves to community service, falls down. We could never get to the other side. The only way we can do it is through the blood of Christ, and he makes that crossing possible. So now, by crossing through the blood of Christ, we come and connect ourselves with God. Sin separates us. Sin always leads to death. This great chasm that we see here is sin. Okay, the chasm is sin. It separates us. But God overcame that sin and allows us to cross. But a lot of people say, no, I don't want anything to do with it. I might have to give this up, might have to give that up. Only if they realize that thing they don't want to give up is what's entrapping them in the first place. So it says how sin does separate us from God. Um, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is the ear so dull that it cannot hear. Our faintest whisper to him, he hears. Isaiah 59 shows Christ as a kinsman redeemer. This is an analogy to Ruth and Boaz. Uh, what a, uh, I won't go to the uh, scripture right now, but what this was, was uh, uh, um, a kinsman redeemer was like a woman whose husband died and they had no son. So there was no one to inherit the property. They would go to a brother who was not married. So we're not talking incest here. It'll be a brother who was not married, 
had no children, the responsibility was for him to take that life now and redeem, to bring back, buy back that land that would have been lost because no one was to, uh, to, to rightfully take it. And so Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. We, we are basically have died in our sin and there is no one to redeem us. But Christ is the kinsman redeemer who dies for us and re buys us back so we can cross the bridge over into God's arms. And so when we read the story of Ruth and Boaz, she mentions about, uh, Ruth mentions about him being the redeemer to, since her husband had died, that he was to claim her by back the inheritance. God's spirit will indwell Israel again during the millennial reign. Jesus quotes Isaiah 60, a very interesting passage. It says, the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good things unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, remember the story, Jesus goes in to the tabernacle and they give him the scroll and he's to read. And so he reads this part of Isaiah where we are right now and he, he stops there. And so let's read the story. It says the spirit, and so he's, he's quoting what we, we just read here. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he's reading this now. He's reading, okay, Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He continues with Isaiah. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He stops. He deliberately stops. He doesn't finish verse two because the rest of verse two is his second coming. So let's see what the rest of verse two. It says, he to proclaim the acceptable of the year of the Lord. Now, this is, again, what makes the Old Testament confusing is because you've got to understand, sometimes there's a break right in the middle of the sentence. Okay, so his first coming was to proclaim the acceptable of the year of the Lord, that today was the day of salvation because he was the Messiah. And... At some later time, he's going to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. And what is that day, day of vengeance? Okay, that's going to be uh, one at the end of the tribulation period when he comes as Lord of Lord, uh, uh, King of Kings and uh, Lord of Lords, and he separates the sheep from the goats. It's also going to come at the end of the tribulation when the unbelievers face the great white throne judgment and they're thrown into hell, lake of fire, Gehenna. Okay, that's, that's where they're going to go and comfort all that mourn. All that second part of verse two is yet to happen. So why does he leave it out? Because he was only dealing with this first part. The second part, we're still waiting for this to happen. And he stops right there. Now, Isaiah makes a comparison against Gentiles who will receive Christ uh, and, and those who reject him. It says, I, myself, uh, I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. In other words, Gentiles are going to be the ones who's going to actually be turning to him. Uh, we see this a lot after the day of Pentecost, how many Gentiles were flocking and the Jews were rejecting. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. So who's he talking about? Okay, the Messiah. Okay, the Jews rejected him. I said, here am I, here am I to a nation who did call, who did not call on my name. So he's talking about, I'm going to bring Gentiles into the fold. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. See, Jesus was coming to preach to Israel. Okay. Uh, he was not coming necessarily to preach to the Gentiles because he's preaching to Israel to get them to accept him as Messiah. That was his, his goal. But 
they were going to reject him and it's going to be then open to Gentiles who were going to flock to him, which we saw all over the Roman world, uh, who walk in the ways which is uh, uh, to the rebellious nation was Israel, who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. So Israel is going to turn their back. Gentiles are going to come to him. The church age is going to be formed, which is Jews, Gentile, Christians. Okay. But God's not done with Israel yet. Okay, it still has a place. Isaiah makes a comparison, again, to those we just read. Isaiah 65 states, not all Jews will reject God. Now, we'll, uh, Zechariah um, will get into this. Now, um, we still have a... Uh, I, I'm hoping maybe in the spring I might do this, uh, we'll go through all the minor prophets now. And when we get to Zechariah, this is going to be absolutely amazing. But uh, we'll see what happens next year when we'll go. Uh, this is what the Lord says. Just as the new wine is found in the cluster and one says, do not destroy it, for there's benefit in it. Okay, what's this new wine? Okay, it's going to be a church age, the age where Gentiles will be brought into the fold. So I will act in behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all all of them. Okay. Um, okay. Not only that, but what's also talking about is the remnant of Jews. There's always going to be a remnant of Jews who's going to stay close to the Lord. Okay. Jews plus God. Okay. They're, they're, they were always there. Okay. There's going to be a cluster of them. And we're going to see later when Jesus comes, okay, his second coming to earth, there's going to be a remnant of Jews who's going to uh, greatly turn their eyes to the Messiah and realize who he is. Now, Zechariah says, and I'll pour out on the house of David. Now, this is Israel, okay, right at the right before his second coming. The tribulation has happened. Armageddon is fighting. All the nations of the world is attacking Jerusalem. Uh, those unbelieving Jews are going to be carried away and to far and distant land. Those who remain in uh, Israel, they are going to become the true Israel. And God says, all Israel will believe in me. And that is those who's going to remain in Jerusalem. It says, and I'll pray on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of pleading, so that they will look at me whom they pierced. When Jesus comes a second time, they're going to see Christ coming, to the earth. It says every eye will see him. They will mourn for him. They're going to have an incredible turn of heart, like one mourning for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him because the Jews are going to suddenly realize who their Messiah is. The first time it's going to happen where this whole nation is going to suddenly realize, oh my goodness, what have we done? You know, this is the Messiah. And there's going to be a tremendous weeping because of what they have done through their history. But there's going to be a great turning of heart. Isaiah 65 cites a well-known passage concerning the wonders of a millennial king. For behold, I'll create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice for in what, whatever I uh, forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem rejoicing in her people for gladness. So when you read passages like this, Yes, it was when they returned after their 70-year captivity, but we're talking about the millennial period. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives only a few days, or in the millennial time, or an old person who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age, uh, for the youth will die at the age of a hundred. Okay, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought a curse. So there's going to be a tremendous of longevity, long life is going to happen during the millennial time. They're going to build houses and inhabit them. They'll plant vineyards, eat their fruit. They will not build on another inhabitant. They will not plant and another eat it. In other words, going, Jesus will reign. There's going to be law. There's going to be order. For if the lifetime of a tree, so will the days of my people. They're going to live long, those who survive the tribulation. And the Jews come to know the Lord and repopulate the earth. We'll be reigning with them. But in new bodies, we won't die. 
they will, but they'll have long life. My chosen ones will fully enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or give birth to children for disaster, for they are the descendants of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Now, and it'll come, this is something that will surprise you. It'll also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. In other words, during the millennial time, Jesus is going to know what we need. He's going to answer, answer our prayers, answer our needs. While they're still speaking, I'll listen. It's not the lion and the lamb that will lie down. While we say the lion and the lamb, it isn't. The wolf and the lamb will lie down, graze together. It's not lion and the lamb. The wolf and the lamb will gra graze together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. And dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm on all my mountains, says the Lord. Talking millennial reign. Okay. When Christ returns to earth, Israel's restoration will happen quickly. And I won't go to this because I need to knock down here. Uh, but uh, the earth is going to be restored quickly. Israel is going to be restored quickly. There's going to be a tremendous missionary zeal that's going to break out uh, because at this time it's going to be all believers. Okay, but they're going to be talking about the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. Now there's going to be new populations as time comes on, and there'll be missionary zeals there. And then Isaiah gives a last warning to those who refuse Christ. It says, for just as the new heavens of the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your descendants in your name endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath. All mankind will come to bow before me, says the Lord. Then they will go out and look at the corpses of the people who have rebelled against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be extinguished. There'll be an abhorrence to all mankind. Those who don't believe in Jesus, there's going to be an eternal forever judgment. Look at Mark and Revelation says, and if your eye is causing you to sin, throw it away. Now he's not meaning literally, but it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two and be thrown into hell or Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom. Say, same thing here, where their worm does not die and their fire is not extinguished. So God does talk about an eternal judgment we call hell. We don't like to talk about hell, but there is a hell, a hell in which people are going to go who have deliberately rejected Jesus. Look what Revelation says. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and uh, heaven fled and no place was found for them. Now, after the millennial reign, after the thousand years, there's going to be a great white throne judgment. It's not for believers. We will already have had our rewards. Okay. What about our sin? Oh, it gets burned out. So it'll be, we will have a reward celebration. But at the end of the millennium, uh, the dead, the dead uh, will be resurrected with their bodies. They're going to stand before the throne of God. And verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, the great, the small standing before the throne. Great right through. The books are going to be open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead, those, the dead in this case, meaning the bodies who are going to be resurrected to meet the spirits of those who rejected Christ, were judged from the things which are written in the book according to their deeds. During that time when you talk, uh, we're, uh, we're witness to about the Lord. Yeah. Why did you reject it? Remember that time you rejected it? Remember that time? Remember that vision I gave you? Remember that dream I gave you? Why'd you reject it? And they're going to have to give an answer. Now the sea gave up the dead who were in it. That means the bodies. And death and Hades, just real quick. What's Hades? That's where the spirits of those to die, today are who die without Christ. Okay. They're going to be resurrected. Death is the body will meet them. They'll become uh, born them. They were judged, each one of them, according to their deeds, not us. These are non-believers. Then death and Hades, the physical body with the spirit joined. That's death. That's Hades, physical body, spirit. Were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, not only death of the body, uh, meaning the eternal destruction, okay, then uh, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire and it's for eternity. 
They don't die. Death here is a metaphor of the destruction of the body, but not destruction to non-existence. Salvation is for today, okay? Again, I, I, you see this prayer, I give it all the time in my, my lessons. And I'm just going to end with this. And I just say, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, you've never asked Jesus into your heart, God's merciful, he's reaching out to you. And I'm just going to offer this prayer. And if this is you, just say it. You could ask Christ into your heart and be a brand new babe in Christ, have God's spirit, and know that all these judgments they're not for you. You're going to have eternal reward. So if that's you and you're here tonight, you never ask Christ in your heart, just pray this along in your heart as I pray it out loud. So you just can quietly say, dear Jesus. So say, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I will trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. He said, I will trust and follow you as my Lord and my Savior. Guide my life and help me do your will. Guide my life and help me do your will. In your name, amen, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, hallelujah, brand new. We're all going, we're going to be together in heaven for all eternity.